I'm glad to be here this morning and seeing your faces so we can worship together. The song we're going to sing is saying, I could sing of your love forever. If you have reasons to sing of God's love, join us in worship and in prayer. Um, let God talk to you this morning. Let, um, let your heart be open for his message as well. Let's worship him. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing up when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing up when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Though I feel like dancing, this foolishness I know. When the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing. Of your love forever, I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me and your love to those around
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around this song a lot and one part that really talked to me this morning was when we talked about Jesus the name above our all names and the bridge when we said I will build my life upon your love upon this firm foundation and this is so strong if we believe that Jesus's name is the name above all names and we know that for a fact and we believe that because he defeated death because he, he can fight everything and he has won everything and he will win everything. And this song really matches the next one we're going to sing that talks about Jesus being victorious. Because his biggest victory was 
um, winning death and conquering that so he could save me, so he could save you. And there is no other reason f other reasons for us to worship but, but saying, Jesus, your name is above all name because God has exalted you upon your death on the cross and resurrection. And because you resurrected, we can be free and we can know for sure that we can have that love and we can have that relationship. And that is... That is something for us to experience now. So while we sing this next song, just think about that for a little while. Is the resurrection of Jesus impacting my life today the way it should be? And if not, what can I do about it? What should I do about it? What can I pray for? And just let the love of God come to your heart right now and speak to you. Because his name is powerful and he is the almighty God. The hair that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see. In your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name that held us now gives way to him who is our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me and your of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected
resurrected king is a resurrecting me and by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is a resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is a resurrecting That soldiers watched in vain Was borrowed for three days His body there would not remain Cause our God has robbed the grave And our God has robbed the your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me and in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Thank you, God, for the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for this truth that we can trust and we can say, by your spirit, we will rise. And it's from the ashes of the king because the resurrected king has resurrected me. Thank you for such big love for us. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if, uh, if you would this morning open your Bibles to Psalm 112. All right, take your outline and place it there. It's so good to see uh, many of you here. Maybe it's your first time back in the building in a while, and we're grateful. We know for some it's going to kind of be a, a process, and we're good with that. Uh, and so we're glad that you're here. I want to say again, happy Father's Day to the men that are gathered here. Uh, we want to encourage you and be a blessing to you. Uh, but anyway, uh, Psalm 112, if you have your outline, place it right there. There's a story I heard several years ago that was of a husband that was really wanting to do something special for his wife on her birthday. In fact, he, you know, he had kind of gotten into a rut, you know, over the years, and he thought, you know, this year I want to do something really special for her. So he even thought of it weeks in advance. And a few weeks before her birthday... He woke up in the morning and he was kind of sitting on the edge of the bed and he noticed his wife as she walked by the mirror that morning, she said, I'd like to be eight again. Well, he knew immediately, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I mean, this is going to be the best birthday she's ever had. So on the morning of her birthday, he got up early in the morning, made her a nice big bowl of cocoa pops. 
and then took her to an Adventure World theme park. And I mean, they had an incredible day. He put her on every ride in the park, the death slide, the wall of fear, the screaming roller coaster. I mean, every ride that they had. And five hours later, they were staggering out of the theme park. Her head was reeling. Her stomach felt upside down. And then he took her to McDonald's. And he ordered her a Happy Meal with extra fries and a chocolate shake. And then after that, it was off to the movies. They went and watched the movie, had popcorn, soda pop, her favorite candy. She had peanut M&Ms. I mean, it was a fabulous adventure. And finally, she wobbled home with her husband, collapsed into bed, absolutely exhausted from the day. And he leaned over to his wife with a big smile and lovingly asked, said, well, honey, what was it like being eight again? She immediately opened her eyes and her expression suddenly changed and she said to him, I meant my dress size, you dummy. <laughs> now, there's actually a moral to this story and that's this, that even when a man is listening, he is still going to get it wrong, right? Now, I, I know some of you men can relate to that, right? You've been down that road before. And, uh, you know, today on Father's Day, I want to help us get things right. In fact, today, men, I want to encourage you. I, I want to come alongside you as a fellow struggler to help us be real men, to be godly men, the men that God has created us to be. In fact, I want to challenge you to not just float through life, but make a decision to live a life of significance. Make a decision to leave a legacy. Don't just let your life pass by without choosing to make an impact. In fact, the truth is this morning, I'm not just really talking to fathers. I'm talking to all of us in this room. I'm talking to our graduates, those who are even young adults. Are they looking of launching into life? I want to encourage you not to just choose success, but instead choose significance. Something that's going to matter uh, for eternity. Now, you know, in Orlando at the Epcot Center, they have a feature that has a giant slab of black granite all over. There's tons of granite, and there's a big sign that says, leave your legacy. And really what they do is for a certain fee, they will take your picture, they will fo that photo then will be chemically transferred onto these granite rocks, so for all of time, your picture will be on this granite stone. And there's actually hundreds and uh, thousands of people who've already put their little picture on this giant granite stone. And I thought to myself, you know, why? why? Why would there be so many people that would pay a fee to do that? And you know, I think that the truth to it is because all of us deep down inside, we want to leave a legacy. I mean, we want to know that our life matters. You know, we, we, we want to know that as we go through this life, we leave a, a mark that, that would make a difference for good and for the glory of God. And today, I want to talk to us about leaving a lasting legacy. In fact, we're going to take a week away. We've been studying the book of Philippians. And today, we're going to do more of a topical Bible study. And we're going to deal with this issue of leaving a legacy. We're going to see some traits that I think are woven all through Scripture that really are ways we can invest our lives that will matter for now and for eternity. And so, so I want you to notice what it says here in Psalm 112, beginning in verse 6, or the latter part of verse 6. It says, the righteous one will be remembered forever. Now, the truth is, you know, we want to be remembered. People are remembered for something, some People write books or they create art that will outlast them. Some people build buildings and put their name on it. Some of them have the resources to give to an institution and then get your name on a building. But the problem with that is that will last until someone has more money to give and then they'll take your name off of it and replace it with somebody else's name on there and your legacy is gone. Clay Jones in his book, Immortal, talks about this desire that we all have to live on. And he said one of the common traits is that many of us say, well, I'm, I'm going to live on through my children. And there's obviously a healthy way to approach that and an unhealthy way 
to approach that. But I think it's interesting. Notice on your outline, Proverbs 13, 22, paraphrase from the message says, a good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. So what, what, what is it that we're passing on to the next generation? You know, we, we, we want a legacy. So sometimes what we find in America is we say, you know, to do that, our kids have to be successful. And so sometimes parents and even dads, you know, want our kids to succeed, to be the, the best at whatever it is they're doing. And, you know, there, there's obviously nothing wrong with that in perspective. But the most important thing that you can model and give away to your kids is not really this vision of success, but it is a life of significance. I, I really want to encourage us to think about this shift to significance. Because ultimately, that is what's going to matter. That's what's going to last. So the question I want us to think about is this. How do you leave a lasting legacy? Well, we're going to notice four characteristics, or actually three characteristics, that are woven through Scripture, that if you live these values and you give these values away, you will have moved from success to significance. You'll move to something that can move beyond even your lifetime that will, that will matter for now and for eternity. So what are the choices? Number one, you can write this down. Number one, choose integrity. Choose integrity. Now, I know when I say the word integrity, that's kind of this word out there that all of us would say, I want to be a person of integrity. The question becomes this, what, what does integrity mean? Someone has said integrity is an outward reflection of an inward connection, that we're living out our faith from a biblical perspective. It's, it's, it's living out what we say we believe. It is more about our walk than our talk. Someone got more specific and said, really, integrity is composed of three different activities. It is telling the truth, it is keeping your word, and it is practicing what you say you believe. So in other words, if you really want to be a person of integrity, then you always tell the truth. You then make it a commitment to keep your word or your promises. You choose to practice what you say you believe. If those traits mark your life, then you are a person of integrity. That is something that you can give that is you know, beyond even you know, the here and now that will matter in the next generation. Now, the Bible talks a lot about these qualities. Notice here, Proverbs 17, 7. It says, respected people do not tell lies, and fools have nothing worthwhile to say. In other words, if you're going to leave a legacy, you've got to be a person that you, that you can trust. And a trustworthy person is a person who tells the truth. And so one of the traits we have to learn is to speak the truth in love. To, to speak the truth, to do what we say, and it is an important commitment. I mean, ever thought, why is it that we look around our society and many leaders are held in such low esteem today? Why is that? Well, often it is because they, they just don't tell the truth. I mean, you can maybe hear you know, what was said a year ago is completely different than what was said now, and it reeks of a lack of integrity, and as a result, no one wants to follow so if you want to leave a legacy, the starting point is choosing integrity. Tell the truth. Do what you say. Notice Proverbs 25, 14. A person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. So let me ask you, have you ever failed to keep a promise? I know some of you have somebody say, well, pastor, no, not about me. Well, let, let, me, let me jog your memory. What about this? Have you ever said, listen, I'll return it as soon as I'm done with it? Some of you are thinking about your garage right now, right? I mean, you may need to travel through there. Maybe you said something like, listen, I won't tell anyone what you've told me, but it's so good, I just can't keep quiet, you know? Or maybe you've made this statement, hey, the check is in the mail, or I'll be home at 6 p.m. Or, you know, we can play this weekend, son. Or we'll do it when things settle down. Or have you ever made this statement, my diet begins tomorrow. You know, if you want to leave a legacy, you work on keeping your word. Studies show that the number one cause of resentment that children have towards their parents 
are parents that don't keep their promises. In other words, <coughs> they make promises to their kids and then they break them. So one of the keys is learning to keep your word. Now, the question we would ask is this, well, is it easy to live with integrity? And I would say the answer is no. In fact, it's not in me. It's not in my nature. I need God's help to be a person of integrity. And, and, and because that's true, I think we ought to make this next verse maybe our prayer for the week. Notice here Psalm 101, verse 2 from the Living Bible. It's paraphrased. It says, I will try to walk a blameless path, but how I need your help, especially in my own home where I long to act as I should. Well, I tell you, don't we agree with that? I mean, have you ever noticed that it's a lot easier to be impressive from a distance than it is up close and personal? Because I mean, you know what? Everyone in your family, they know the truth about you, you know? I'll never forget the, the first year that we went to Brazil, we, there were four or five of us from the church that went, and we went with South Tulsa Baptist Church. And so they had a missions night where we were going to tell about our trip from Brazil. So I went over there. I brought my daughter, Macy. She was just a teenager. She went with me over there. And so we went that night, and they had this service. Well, when it was my time, man, I got up. I, got to, I told these funny stories about the trip, about these cool things that God did. And I don't know if you've, you know, if you've spoken before. It was just one of those nights where you felt like, man, this is going good. I mean, you know... We're, they're love. This is man. This is awesome. So I was just, man. I just thought this. This is great. So I I go back to my seat and I'm thinking, man, that that was impressive. That was awesome. And I sit down and I look at my teenage daughter and she gives me that look like, you ain't that funny, and it wasn't that good. <laughs> and I realized, you know what? She had heard all those stories before, you know, and and I, I came to this realization that it's a lot easier to impress people from a distance, right? I mean, they don't see you up close. They don't see your mistakes, your faults, your weaknesses. But let me tell you something. Real integrity is when those who know you best respect you the most. I mean, that is integrity. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a minute, and if, you know, you can write it down, make sure nobody's looking. How would you rate yourself on integrity? In other words, if you were really honest, let me ask you something. Do you tell the truth? I mean, is that a commitment? Do you always tell the truth? Do you keep your word? Do you practice what you say you believe? You might say, yeah, I'm doing well. Or you might be honest and put NW, this needs some work. But if you want to leave a legacy, you've got to choose integrity. Number two, not only choose integrity, but secondly, choose service. Choose service. In other words... You've you got to make a decision to be a servant to people around you. They have done study after study after study, and they've asked children, kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know what? Not one child says, I want to be a servant. <laughs> no one says, hey, that's what I want to be. I want to be a servant. You know what? We want to be celebrities. We want to be stars. We want to be leaders. And yet Jesus said, if you want to be great, you've got to learn to be a servant of others. Serving other people really is the key to a lasting legacy. And, and we as followers of Jesus should set the pace for that. In fact, notice for, uh, Proverbs 14, 22. You will earn the trust and respect of others. Notice this. If you work for good, if you work for evil, you are making a mistake. Now I want you to think of it. Most of us think of it. We, we work for our own good. And, and, you know, that obviously that's not a bad thing. We need to do that. But, but for some of us, that's our total focus. I mean, it's about our dreams, our ambitions, our goals. We think about what we want. We don't really necessarily think about the good of others. And that's why most people don't leave a lasting legacy, because they don't choose service. Now, how do you, how do you make this shift? Well, I think the Apostle Paul kind of lays it out as a follower of Christ. Notice what he says in, in Colossians. He put it this way. He says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. In other words, if we have a heart that, listen, everything we do, we're going to do for the glory of God, we then become passionate about the things that God is passionate about. And I can tell you up front, God is passionate about people, all people. 
So we need to be eager to help others, eager to serve others. Whatever you do, find a way to make a difference in the lives of people. So whatever you do, do unto the Lord. You know, Brother Lawrence wrote the classic book, Practicing the Presence of God. I hope you, if you haven't read that book, it's a small book, it's worth reading. He, and he talked about living in this idea of God's presence. But he says, you know, what you do, it, to live in God's presence, everything you do is for the glory of God. So that would mean, you know what, I, I, I'm going to clean this house today, Lord, for your glory. I'm going to make this bed in a way because I, I want to bring glory to you. I want to serve this client today in a way that brings glory to, do, to you. And when you do it in the name of Jesus, it becomes an act of service. It's you're serving God and you're serving others and you do it with passion. You see, the longer I live, the more I've come to this conclusion. There really are no great people. But there are ordinary people committed to great causes and purposes. And you don't have to be the head of the class to leave a legacy. You don't have to be the most brilliant or talented or most beautiful to leave a legacy. How do you leave a legacy? By choosing to serve others. By making a decision that, you know what? I, I'm going to use the, what, the blessings that God has given me, my, my shape, my spiritual gifts, my abilities, my, my talents, my life experiences, and I, and I want to shape them in such a way that, that it glorifies God and it blesses others. When Andrew Carnegie, the great philanthropist, died, they found a note in his desk that really he had written out his life mission as a young man. And this is what he wrote, and I quote, he said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life making as much money as I can, and I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. And that really is exactly what he did. In his lifetime, he gave away over $450 million. Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Institute, the foundation. And if you think about it, if he would have kept it, the truth is he would be a nobody. But because he was willing to give it away, I mean, the tragedy is far too many people We're wasting our lives on things that just aren't going to last. The fact is, some things will last forever. Some things, though, are going to burn up and decay. Some things will make a difference forever, and some things are not going to be worth thinking about tomorrow. Too many of us are investing our time, energy, and talents really in things that just aren't going to last. And Jesus warned us about this. Notice John 6, 27. Jesus said, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts, for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Now notice this, Jesus is giving a principle. He's saying, don't waste your life on things that will rot and spoil and decay and rust, but instead... Invest your life in things that are going to last over the long haul for eternity. Make a difference. In other words, the truth is fame won't last, status won't last, pleasures won't last, power doesn't last, and things don't last. But there are two things that will last. One thing that will last is truth. It's going to last. I mean, Jesus was pretty clear about that. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will stand forever. You want to build your life on the truth of God's Word. It is a foundation that will last. It's why it's so important that you and I can develop and understand a biblical worldview, because that's what matters. There's so many ideas out there today. I mean, it's all around our culture. And, and here's the thing. We welcome all questions. I tell you, our, our view at all of that is, listen, there's no question that's off the table. Because we as followers of Jesus need to understand what we believe. Because the biblical worldview, I believe, is built on truth, but not only that, it produces human flourishing. And so, therefore, it's important that we know the truth and that we stand on the truth. So truth will last. But another thing that will last is people. In other words, people will last forever. Everyone will be in one of two places, heaven or hell. So live in such a way that you take as many people with you to heaven as possible. Jesus is our hope. So if you're going to leave a legacy... Build your life on the truth of God's Word and invest in other people. In other words, serve them, love them, encourage them, bring them into the kingdom, help them know God, help them you know, discover God's plan and purpose for their lives. So what are you investing your life in? One, one way to think of it is something like this. I wonder how many of you could name, for instance, the last five winners of Miss America. 
Or you could name the last five winners of the Nobel or Pulitzer Prize. Or you could list the last half dozen Academy Award winners. Or even the most valuable players of the Major League, in Major League Baseball, the NFL, the NBA. You know, I watched a documentary, some of you may remember, remember that summer, the controversy when you had Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa hitting all those home runs and the controversy. And remember, they, I mean, they were all over the news. And the truth is, pretty much right now, they're forgotten. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, you know, yesterday's heroes are forgotten. But, but let, let, me, let me ask you this way, uh, another quiz. Can you name and remember the most helpful teacher you had in school? I bet you can. Can you name two friends that help you through a hard time? Well, I bet you can. Can you name someone who taught you something worthwhile? I bet you can. Can you name that person who believed in your potential growing up? Well, I bet you can. My point is the second part is a whole lot easier. You know why? Because people who make a difference and leave a legacy are actually not the most famous, wealthy, or talented, but they are people who served you in love. Leave a legacy by serving. That's why I always say this, you know, one of the greatest ways you can invest your life, and you expect a pastor to say it, but I believe if you want to invest your life for eternity, serving in a local body of believers. I mean, literally investing your life in whether it's in extended care and, 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 and ministering to preschoolers or, or children's church or with, with you know, our, our children's ministry or students or even with other adults. Let me tell you something. You are making a significant impact. I mean, I think about those that impacted me over the years. Certainly, I can think of great preachers and, uh, and, and books I've read and all that kind of stuff. But really, you know what it was? It was, it was I didn't become a believer until I was 15. It was a lot of the leaders, even in this church, that worked in the, in the student ministry, that taught a Sunday school class, went to Falls Creek, all those kind of things. Because let me tell you something, that is wh when you make an impact because you are investing in a life of service. Here's the thing. It's not as glorious, but it is that daily investment that makes the difference. So, so I, I would encourage you to, to think of it. Let, let, let me kind of put it this way. I'll put it real simply. Is there something that you're doing on a regular basis that doesn't necessarily benefit you or your family? It's simply for the glory of God and for others. In other words, you, you do that because you want to honor Jesus. You want to be a blessing to others. That's how you invest your life. If not, I would encourage you to do that. Find that way to invest your life. Well, if we want to make a, an impact, what is it? Well, choose integrity, choose <clears throat> service, and thirdly, choose humility. Choose humility. In fact, notice here <clears throat> what it says, Proverbs 29, 23, a person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. Let me tell you something you'll find all through Scripture, and that's this humility matters to God you can make a lot of mistakes in life and you look at scripture but when you have a humble heart God can work in your life so you need to stay humble or you'll stumble as I've heard said before remember the lesson of the well when you get to the top and you're ready to blow that's when they harpoon you you know I, I heard about two Texas ranchers that were bragging about their ranches one guy said what's the name of your cattle ranch he said, well, it's the Circle W, Rockin' R, Rollin' B, Around the World, Rainbow Ranch. He said, wow, that's quite a name. You must have quite a big herd of cattle. He said, no, not really, because very few of them survived the branding. <laughs> well, well, listen, there's a couple of things that are going to test your humility. One of the things that tests your humility is praise. In other words, when you are complimented, do you, do you go on an ego trip? I mean, someone has said that the human species is the only species that when you pat, when you, when you, uh, pat them on their, head, their, their back, their head swells. And, you know, it, it, it's a, a story I heard several years ago about Winston Churchill. You know, Churchill, I think, maybe the most significant person in the 20th century. I would argue certainly in, during World War II one guy asked him, he said, Does it, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? His response was, yes, it's quite flattering. 
He said, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be three times as large. And he's, you know, the, the truth is, is this, don't let your head swell. Treat praise like you do criticism. It's like bubble gum, you chew on it, but you don't swallow it, because ultimately what matters is what God thinks of you. So one of the tests is praise. The other test is our mistakes. I mean, the fact is you don't have to know it all to be respected. You just have to admit that you don't know it all because humility is being honest about your weaknesses. It's being honest about what you don't know. It's being able to laugh at your own faults and weaknesses. Prideful people cannot stand to have their flaws pointed out. So one of the keys to life is learn to laugh at yourself. Someone has said that if you learn to laugh at yourself, you'll have plenty of material for the rest of your life. So, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that you'll see woven in Scripture that humility matters to God. You know, in our D group, we were reading the F260 Bible reading plan. And uh, one of the things we noticed is, you know, when, when Israel wants a king, Saul is the man. Saul was a head taller, you know, a lot of good qualities about him. But honestly, Saul was proud. I mean, he, he did his thing first. And then when it all messed up, he would seek God. And then in the midst of that, you have all of a sudden God chooses this shepherd boy now named David. Now, was David perfect? No. David had a lot of problems. In fact, David was a great sinner, but David was also a great repenter. And what you'll notice, the distinct difference was David had a humble heart. And he was described as a man after God's own heart. And he was far from perfect. Now, folks, the truth of the matter is, God is concerned about the condition of your heart. And humility is a big deal to God. God has a soft spot for people with a humble spirit. In fact, notice James 4. As the scripture says, God gives strength to the humble but sets himself against the proud and haughty. And then notice this, Proverbs 15, 33. Humility and reverence for the Lord will make you both wise and honored. In other words, learn to be humble. Now, listen, how would you rate yourself on humility? If you rate yourself pretty high, then you're pretty proudful, right? No, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. How would you rate yourself on humility? Ask yourself questions like, how teachable are you? When someone points out a flaw, do you immediately get angry and defensive? You know, one of the things I, I've learned about myself is I, I, am, I am far too defensive. I, I, you know, and, and honestly, that's just called pride is what that is. And, and, and so examine your, your own heart. You know, the enemy of humility is image. Our society is obsessed with image. And here's what I'm saying this morning. If you want to leave a legacy, if you want to make an impact, then go beyond success and strive for significance by focusing on character. Because you're not going to take your image with you, but you will take character. And if you want to have a great legacy, build character by choosing integrity, by choosing service, by choosing humility, because that will leave a lasting legacy. You say, Pastor, I'd like to do that, but I just can't. Well, let me, let, listen, join the club. I can't either. I need God's help. Maybe today you need to make that decision to place your trust in Christ. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life, that when you die, you'll spend eternity in heaven? Listen, the truth is our sin has separated us from God, but God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus who, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life. He dies on a Roman cross for your sins and mine. He is raised from the dead, ascended to be with the Father, and one day he's coming again. If you and I are willing to turn from our sin, place our faith in Christ, and follow him, he gives us this gift of eternal life. He will empower you to be all that God has designed you to be. Maybe today you need to make that decision for Christ. Now, our, our invitation time is a little different. In fact, here's how you might respond. There's a blue card in front of you. If you want information on how to receive Christ, if you want information on what it means to be a member at all that, any of the ministries we have, you can fill out that card, any question that you have, and place them in these prayer boxes before we leave here today in the giving boxes, 
and we'll respond as soon as possible. Or you can respond, you might notice on the screen, if you want to text at all of that BC to 81010, if you want information on receiving Christ, any of the ministries, what it means to be a member, just text that, we'll respond to you. Or maybe you have some prayer requests if you'd like for us to pray with you, just text us at Olivet Pray uh, to eight ten ten, and we will respond as soon as possible. So we're going to pray together, and then we're going to stand and sing uh, a time of commitment together. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you, Lord, for the hope of the gospel. And Father, I pray that by your presence and power, we would choose significance, that we would live a life that would matter now and for eternity. And so, Father, I pray this morning for each one that's gathered here, those who may need to receive Christ, those who may need to recommit their lives. God, I pray that you'd give us the courage to step out and follow through to become, you know, all that you've designed us to be. And so, Lord, we just give this time of invitation to you for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. to see you. We really truly have missed seeing your faces and worshiping together and we hope that uh, you'll take this word with you. Men, especially today as we celebrate Father's Day, once again we want to thank you for joining us and make sure you call your father today and wish him a happy Father's Day. If your father is no longer with us, just say a quick prayer. Thank the Lord for the father that you had and for the influence that they had in your lives.